modern European history historian who teaches at Royal Holloway University of London in the UK and my own publications research over the years indeed the decades now has been ma mainly about the war of 1936 to 39 in Spain and the ensuing Franco dictatorship, 40 year Franco dictatorship. And I mean, I've, I've stuck with these things, not because I was stuck, but because they remain, I think, unfinished business um, in many ways, not only for people inside Spain, but it, it, certainly continentally. And in, in some ways, maybe even on a global scale, a global reach, these are unfinished. This is unfinished business. Um, for example, in the case of the the, the so-called civil war, but of course it was an international war of monumental scale, 1936 to 39. It was a war where, where international fascism lined up against the social democratic republic bent on, on social reforms and where volunteers who were refugees, migrants, exiles from across Europe and beyond came to Spain to defend that social democratic republic. Um, or to defend a republic that enshrined the possibility of serious social and economic change. Um, and so in a sense, that whole issue of migration and the, 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 the aspiration to social change cuts through from that, in some ways, apparent long ago, far off war to come you know, straight into the present day to the sort of still searing agenda of the relationship between migration and the possibilities of social change. Um, not necessarily utopic social change, but some form of progressive social change. So it seems to me the war is not, it's not a far away war. It's a war which is still, un, you know, still unfinished business. And equally true for, for Francoism, which came at the war that came after that war, the 40 year war against swathes of Spain's civilian population. Um, what was it? It was an extreme form of populist nationalism, which was bent on stopping those aspirations to social change and reform, and which for, for de years and years maintained a form of war against significant swathes, tens of thousands of people, even more than millions of its own population. Um, it turned Spain in the 1940s, for 10 years after the battlefield war, into a, a kind of prison camp um, or a prison ship. Um, and where there was very, there were various for, forms of serious population surveillance, indeed totalitarian population surveillance, and enforced labour work camps, well into the 1950s and in some cases beyond in Spain. Um, and all of this was kind of veiled for a very long time in in Spain and, and and Western Europe behind the veil of the Cold War. But the thing that keeps me with these topics, the war and, and Francoism, is that you know we're now 40 years on from that dictatorship. Dictatorship uh, in Spain, the end of the Franco dictatorship, the end of the 1970s, and yet it's still it's still the past that will not pass away. That there's a kind of latent or well, in more than residual legitimacy, political legitimacy that adheres to Francoism, in spite of all that we historically know about what it did um, and what it meant in terms of crimes perpetrated. There's a kind of um, legitimacy that we can't seem to dispel and in a sense it's it's what keeps me there it's why it's why it's unfinished business it's it's what it's the past that will not pass away i mean currently i'm engaged in a, a long-term project on franco's prison system not just in the 1940s not just the kind of period of high repression but all the way through to the end of the dictatorship so 40s 50s 60s into the well to the late 1970s really and i'm coming across m immense censorship of state and institutional records all the time walls come down i can't see things and so that itself is somehow telling me that this this is this is not the quiet past this is a past which people are still kind of trying to shroud in you know 40 years of democratic spain we're still not able to look at those records of the prison system so so I, i'm you know i'm not sticking with these topics because kind of i'm in a rut <laughs> but i'm i'm with them still 10 years on from um, from when I was in New York, um, as in the King Juan Carlos Center, precisely because they're still unfinished business, and they're still they still need we still need to get to the bottom of them. Well, I came to the Juan Carlos Center as the chair, uh, or in the visiting chair in Spanish culture and civilization, in the spring semester of two thousand and ten. I followed Judge, the Spanish judge or super judge. 
Balthazar Garfon. I mean, I came, I was the, I was the visiting chair after him. And so I, I, I thought that kind of linked back um, to what I was saying about this kind of unfinished business ongoing in, um, in, in Spain with Francoism, because in a sense, he, as the previous chair, had, was obviously fighting a much more high profile um, media kind of attendant battle to open up um, the, the dark history of the crimes of Francoism, only to have the democratic state in Spain flatten him um, in a complicated series of, of legal um, cases which were not necessarily related to um, his attempts to bring cases against Franco's perpetrators, but which nevertheless, in debarring him judicially in Spain, more or less flattened the, the possibilities of opening up this unfinished business that I was talking about. So he was before me. I arrived as the visiting chair in the spring term of, of 2010, but I also already had some ties with both the centre, with the Juan Carlos Centre, and with NYU's Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and, and in other ways with NYU too. Um, first of all, I had in the mid-1990s co-designed, written, edited a big book on Spanish cultural studies uh, with Joe Labatt, with, with, the, with the person who became an NYU distinguished and now emerita professor, Joe Labagne, um, who was at the time when we did the book on Spanish cultural studies in the mid 1990s, my colleague in London at another of the London University Colleges at Birkbeck, but somewhere, I'm a bit hazy on the chronology, but somewhere between 2009, 10, she moved to work at NYU and indeed by 2009 was the, was the director of the King Juan Carlos Center. Um, so I had all of that history with Joe Labagne and the book, which I think, um, is considered, you know, one of the seminal volumes on of, of, of you know Spanish cultural studies work today. Um, Joe went on at NYU to found uh, a now celebrated journal, as a, 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 in a sense, which emerged from the collaborations in that book, the Journal of Spanish Cultural Studies, which is now going from strength to strength. I mean, it's I think it's well celebrated. It must be twenty three years. It's well celebrated. I know it's twentieth anniversary. But I kind of stood back from that because you know. I'm a historian. I, I, you know, I still, I still believe, as an aside, that of course history is the is the ultimate multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary discipline. You know, it kind of it has borrowed magpie like for for decades. For at least its its progressive end has borrowed from all of these from many uh, disciplines, including you know anthropology, sociology, literary criticism, uh, cultural theory, to 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 be the you know the queen of disciplines. But of course, I would say that I'm a historian. But anyway, I I had a whole other kind of past history with NYU, which was to say with the Tamiment Library, um, that, that the, with its wonderful, its, you know, incomparable collections of, well, extraordinary collections of labour left and civil rights documentation, including, of course, um, archive of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the volunteers who fought um, for the Spanish Republic, who went, 2,800 of them who went from the United States to fight in to spite with the reforming republic in Spain in the 1930s. So I had for many years been a, a kind of a digger in the archives of the of the of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade at Tamament in, in at NYU. So I had all of that history. And indeed in 2008 I'd given a lecture, border crossings, uh, the International Brigades before and after Spain. And I have to say that um, that, uh, that, was that was November 2008, and a year later, um, it was uploaded in a slightly revised form at a, in a podcast service that um, is, emerged, it's, it's independent, but it emerged out of Royal Holloway University of London. It's called Backdoor Broadcasting. And I am reliably told by the chief cook and bottle washer at Backdoor Broadcasting that it has now been, that, that, that uh, podcast has been downloaded over 50,000 times. And I don't know, I mean, you know, I'm not claiming, maybe that's because some, somehow that's, that's in the kind of augmenting um, echo that was the result of me being the chair of, uh, at NYU, I don't know. Maybe people came to know who I was, looked me up, found that um, podcast, downloaded it, but it, it, does, um, it does seem quite a lot of, of, um, of hits, even for, for, for something that's relatively, um, well, not, not, not totally mainstream, shall we say. Um, but anyway, that was my prior um, experience of NYU and the Centre through Joe Labagne and the cultural studies work and 
the, um, the, the work on the Abraham Lincoln Brigades and individual volunteers, which I did at the Tamarment Library. There is a package when you, you come to the visiting chair to the Juan Carlos Centre, you do some teaching, you do some public lecturing and workshops and, and other activities, and I did a, a mix of these. I mean, I taught a, a master's a grad course on the war, but with the folk on the Spanish, on, on, on what's off, you know, the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to nine. But of course, as we all know, you know, I was interested in looking in, in it, at it as a, a kind of European continental civil war and as a war which was global, as I said before, as I began by saying, global in its reach in terms of the kind of migratory diasporic um, patterns which not only led from it, as everybody knows, in terms of the Republican diaspora, but also led to it in terms of the massive amount of inter-European migration, which is a story still, you know, e even recent books on the International Brigades haven't really picked up enough on this. So all of these things I tried to, tried to bring together in the master's course, um, which I taught uh, as part of the of the chairship at, at um, Juan Carlos Center, and I did come across some extraordinarily um, gifted and 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 interesting and, and engaging graduate students. I ha I mean I need that on record for my um, experience of my time at uh, at NYU and with uh, with the chairship. Um, I also you know obviously spent time writing in relation to Francoist violence, Francoist repression. Published a, an article in Dan Stone's big online history of post-war. Oxford University Press History of Postwar Europe, which is a comparative study of what, what it's called what came what came after dictatorship in Greece, France, uh, sorry, Greece, um, Spain and Portugal. Um, af after the fear was over, it was called. Um, so there's all of that. I also um, related to that ran a film series um, which I I called The Afterlife of Violence. Um, it was I mean, I lifted the title from the wonderful visionary anthropologist Michael Tausig, who at the time I was in NYU was teaching up the road in Colombia. But I mean, basically, the afterlife of violence is, is about his contemporary, his work in contemporary Colombia. But I thought it was a brilliant title to sort of capture um, the 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 way I, in which I see Francoism, which is all of the insidious and structural ways in which the violence went on poisoning years and decades afterwards. So I picked some, I think what were described at the time by, well, by, I know by Joe Labani and other people as, as quite an unusual kind of configuration of films. I'm not going to say everything that I did, but um, there, there was a, a wonderful sort of postcard um, which um, the centre came up with. It was designed, I must give him a blast, it was designed by Jose Carlos Casado um, for this Afterlife of Violence series. And two of the films were, uh, there was Saura's Nine, the films were films chosen from the 1960s to the early 2000s. Um, one of them was Carlos Saura's De Prisa De Prisa about if well, juvenile delinquents, as is often uh, as is always said, but basically it's it's about the lost, it's about structural violence and Francoism, the lost generation of the so-called economic miracle of the, the years of rapid, what we can now see as neoliberal developments in Spain. Um, and that, that film, in a sense, tells a story of certain kinds of structural violence. And also, of course, I, I put on as one of the six films the, the remarkable uh, kind of montage documentary film made by Basilio Martín Patino in the mid-1970s, Queridísimos Verdugos, with Dearest Executioners, which is a, a film in which he, he basically interviews at length, among other things, but he interviews at length the three last executioners of the Franco regime, and it is scarifying. I mean, this is a film which to this day I find you know, provoking and exhilarating, and I wish that it, it reached more, I mean, I know it's a famous film, but it it, it doesn't reach big audiences, um, and certainly, um, you know, it's a sort of film that really needs to reach people outside Spain. Um, so it's so we, I put on this 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 series um, related to the the kind of Francoist violence link. I suppose what I spent most of my time doing um, was using the fact that I was actually in New York um, to to complete some biographical research that I'd been doing for many years on one particular international brigader, uh, um, a, a quite a charismatic Finnish-American Lincoln brigader raised in the Bronx called Bill Alto. 
Um, I, I kind of scurried around New York, um, you know, exploring the sights and mysteries of his really quite unusual life. Um, he died in New York City in 1958, um, having spent a lot of the previous time in, in Italy. Um, I have some amazing letters which he wrote to the well, the legendary Italian sinographer Piero Toggi, uh, in which he describes his personal New York, um, hit the kind of personal topography of, of his of his private city, if you like. Um, so I spent time looking around, putting things together for this. Um, and I mean, Bill Alto was an unusual in, um, Lincoln brigader in that he didn't fight with the regular, as most of the brigaders did, they fought with the regular Republican army in Spain in thirty six. Sorry, 37, 30, 1937, 38. But he didn't. He fought with a few other Lincoln brigaders. He fought behind the lines with the Republican guerrilla. And I, in a sense, I was I, I sort of also put together a workshop on the anti-Franco guerrilla, which is something that happened as a panel um, during my time as the visiting chair, because I wanted to kind of link the what was happening in Spain with the the kind of the way in which those guerrillas saw themselves, whether they were anti-Franco guerrillas inside Spain in the 1940s after the Franco regime took over, or they were exiles and migrants and refugees in the French camps who joined the French resistance, who fought with the partisans. They all saw themselves as part of, of a, a continental resistance against fascism, anti-fascist resistance against the Nazi regime. So I wanted to kind of bring that kind of Spain into the broader European picture as part of that panel activity, and also to kind of talk about Bill Alto. Um, on the day of that panel, I had a bright idea because I was always going all over the place um, chasing down trails, tracks to his life. And I had the idea, well, I had a whole day before this evening panel on the gorilla. I would um, go off to, off to Brooklyn and track down something that I wanted to track down. But um, it all went wrong because, uh, of course, Brooklyn, Brooklyn isn't a big, is a very big place. And I kind of didn't quite have the sort of distances in my mind. And so I took off. Um, of course, this is to, to, to do this, and it was the outer, it was, you know, flat bush, way beyond. Uh, I didn't realise how far I was going, and it also turned out to be the day that the, a lot of the, of the subway system broke down, and they had replacement bus services for parts of the route. Um, and it all, I mean, it was, go, as the British say, going to hell in a bucket, and I thought, there's no way I'm getting back to chair this panel. And so what happened was, um, we were just dumped unceremoniously by a bus driver, supposedly near a subway station, but actually nowhere near a subway station. And this was not Brooklyn Heights. This was, you know, a long way down. But fortunately, I was, in, I was with another historian of Francoism, a wonderful woman called Isabel Rohr, who wrote a great book on sort of Franco, the Spanish right and the Jews, anti-Semitism and opportunity. Anyway, she is, has a much better innate sense of urban topography. And so basically we were both tossed off this bus. Uh, and fortunately, uh, as a result of her skill, of course, everybody's going now in their heads, they're going, well, why didn't they turn on their Google Maps? But of course, this is too, this is long, people forget, this was before people had, had Google on their, uh, on their cell phones. I mean, Google Maps were, you know, is quite a recent thing for everybody to be running around. So actually, we had this very sketchy um, sort of, you know, urban, you know, actual physical urban map. So it is a wonder we ever got back. But I did, by the skin of my teeth, get back to chair the session. Uh, but no thanks to my own navigational skills and all, all thanks to my, to my um, companions, as it were. I mean, I suppose I'd say that on my career, it had a kind of augmentative effect. I mean, people knew me more afterwards. Um, I think it hadn't changed the real main direction of travel of the work I do, because I wasn't that young. <laughs> to the uh, Juan Carlos Center, uh, I mean, I'd already established these very broad and I think pretty dynamic sort of areas of, of inquiry uh, in terms of, well, I'm just recapitulating what I said earlier on migration and social change, which, you know, is enough for anybody's lifetime, um, but also, in a sense, not unlinked to that, the problem of state and political violence um, and the limits of nation, of nationalism, um, although huh, today, <laughs> I think we're going backwards. But anyway, um, these were obviously deepened and elaborated uh, by more recent research work after I came away from uh, the Juan Carlos Center. Um, but as I began by saying, uh, I'm up again. I've, I have a big 
externally funded grant at the moment where it's coming to an end, but obviously um, COVID has um, laid waste to much of the research. But basically, I still did an awful lot of research. Um, but coming on, on this study of Franco's prisons from the 19, the prison system and how it changed from the 1940s to the 1970s, um, but coming up all the time against what was whether declared or not state censorship of institutional records about the prisons. So, you know, the, the state, even though it's not the same state in Spain, somehow feels an, a, a kind of continuity with a previous period, which was a dictatorship, and in a sense is not, is not happy. I mean, I'm talking about a state of its, as if it's sentient, but there is you know, something there is which inhabits the spirit of a state, which is still wanting to sit on this institutional prison documentation about the Franco regime and not let research, not just me, of course, but not let researchers at it. Um, and so, I mean, I, I suppose my, my work and my career has moved towards trying to think, obviously trying to find ways around this because there are you know, always ways around censorship. Uh, but at the same time, to, to, to stand back and think about what and I suppose I started to do this about four or five years after coming away from Juan, the Juan Carlos Center. Um, why this is the why is there still this problem in Spain? Um, what what is it? Because in a sense, you know, we keep the, the, the historical evidence. The studies are massive on what happened to victims, recognition, representation of victims. We we do not lack these things, and still and still there is this this kind of not uh, inability to come to terms with all of this. And it suddenly struck me um, that this isn't anything to do with the victims, and it isn't anything to do with what Francoism did. It's to do with this issue of latent undissolved legitimacy if you like and I then started to think and wrote an article on it in the in the London Review of Books in 2015 called The Sacred Dead and because it, it occurred to me that the problem of not being able to come to terms with Francoism and not being able effectively to historically delegitimize it is the problem of the sacred dead. It's the problem of the Francoist dead. It's the problem of the martyrs of the regime who were mythologized, enshrined in discourse, um, monuments to whom were built. You know, so it's not just the Valle de los Caídos, it's the, the monuments to the martyrs or that were all over Spain. It's, and it's even though the, many and most of the monuments have gone, it's still this inability to demythologize the sacred dead. It's nothing to do with the recognition of the victims. It's to do with the inability or you know, certain groups of still powerful um, elites and political sectors of the political class in Spain, you know, have no interest in historicizing a myth. In a sense, it's, I'm, I'm talking about it because it's where my work has gone since the Juan Carlos Center. And in a sense, it's some of the things I was thinking of while I was there that have, have led to it. But I do think this, this, this ongoing and very kind of um, live problem of how to, to get beyond Francoism being considered legitimate is not to do with the victims or the un, unquiet dead. It's to do with the dead that are still mythologized, which are in a sense underpinning that regime. Um, so, so that's a kind of ongoing, ongoing kind of headbanger, <laughs> which I, I struggle with. And, and uh, you know, I mean, a historian can, cannot solve the problem politically. All a historian can do is to lay out what the nature of the problem is. But the nature of the problem, it seems to me, is not knowledge. <laughs> it's, it's the particular status that still adheres um, to these mythic you know, the sacred dead, the mythic dead of Francoism. I found um, both the, the centre, the Juan Carlos Centre, NYU and its Department of Spanish and Portuguese um, to be, you know, really amazing privileged spaces to work in. Um, not that I'm ha unhappy at Royal Holloway, but, but you know, there were, I mean, obviously there is a, there is a, something very special about being invited as an external visiting professor, but, um, you know, obviously I did my job as I understood the brief, which was to inform, educate, enrich others in the, in the matter of my specialist expertise. But of course it was a reciprocal process um, that during that stay, I also had endless opportunities to be enriched by the contacts which I made um, in NYU and in the centre, among staff, among students, and also amongst you know, the very wide and varied audiences which used to attend the special events which were organised um, around and are organised around every visiting Juan, King Juan Carlos um, chair. 
so you'd expect I suppose you'd expect but I think it's worth saying that you know I still have those a lot of those work networks of resources which I developed um, through being the, the visiting chair at the Juan Carlos Center. And f f in a lot of ways, they're friendships too. Those work networks became lasting friendships. They're not just kind of something very instrumental. Um, they still are 10 years on actual friendships. And I suppose so it's, it, it's bound up with this memory of, of, of rich collegiality. So I hope that um, for me, it was an enriching, a really enriching experience being chair um, at the Juan Carlos Centre and I'm very grateful for having been given that opportunity and I hope that I have repaid that debt or indeed perhaps I'm still repaying that debt with uh, debt, debt of gratitude I mean with, with my own work. Academia can be a very sort of competitive, well it is, a very competitive individualistic kind of place and you know one understands why those pressures are there and how that arises but in a sense I've always tried to um, see academia as a collaborative venture to create knowledge which goes on accumulating and in a sense transgenerationally and you know scholars relating to each other across generations and that's in a sense why I was saying that so much of the work in the Juan Carlos Centre with graduate students um, was something I keep as a memory but this you know the, the the whole nature of how scholarship should happen I mean I sort of I mean I don't think I'm being totally nostalgic here when I because 10 years ago but my 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 kind of the patterns for that and not that I've never experienced it be that the kind of collegiality or you know sort of sense of a, of a collective endeavor before of course I had but and, and I have to say that I always associate it very much with Joe Labanyi um, uh, as well as, as somebody who has you know very quietly and subtly kind of projected that over the years wherever she's been um, but I do you know that kind of notion of a collective endeavor a cumulative endeavor I mean I sort of suppose I associate that with Juan with the Juan Carlos chair with my time there and I carry that forward as a, as a kind of something I try and live up to but it's it, you know it's an ideal too because I mean obviously what we do has to be about transmission um, because you know, otherwise, what's the point? You know, um, and so I, you know, that 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 notion of a cumulative endeavour across age groups, across different kinds of people. I mean, that that struck me as as, as very much kind of in, encapsulated in in the centre. Obviously, it's just so rich and so diverse that it is um, a real kind of a real jewel. Um, so you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> Or the, the Juan Carlos Centre is a hard, hard act to follow. But that's, what I, that's the memory of it I retain as a way of doing collective work, I suppose. That's, that's my memory. And that's what pushes me forward, I suppose.